Steve is the Associate Professor of Energy, Geoscience, and Chair of the Environmental Earth Science Department at Eastern Connecticut State University. Outside of the day job, he shares his lifelong interest in amateur astronomy by working as a planetarium lecturer for the Seymour Planetarium in Springfield. He also works with Jack Magus and Dave Gallup. And if any of you people are uh, familiar, they were the people who started the conjunction, which unfortunately is not, uh, not going to happen anymore. He also created and coordinated for 22 years the Astronomical League Lunar Observing Program. And it's what, 22 years, 23 years, something like that? Yeah. Okay. And he's taught uh, countless astronomy classes and workshops for many naturalist uh, school and science groups, such as the Appalachian Mountain Club, Springfield Science Museum, Tim Holland Conservation Center. And tonight uh, he's going to uh, show some one of his main interests is 3D astronomy. So I'm Steve Nathan. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to thank you much for inviting me and also for generously providing the classes that you're using here tonight. And for Linda, your president, for also hosting me here. Um, this program is really an outgrowth of uh, just sort of a side hobby through the years. You know, I produce planetarium stuff, as Russ had mentioned, and a variety of things. But uh, this sort of had its birth long, long ago. I was in sort of an antique shop. And um, just looking at all kinds of crazy old photos that were tossed in a corner. And I came across uh, this one, the one I still have the original. Uh, these old, like, stereo cards. And you may have seen these things before, uh, where you would have on a single card two images of something. You know? And uh, these were very, very common 150 plus years ago maybe up until about the early 1930s or so. Um, but I'll give you more details on this as, as I jump into the, to the uh, program. But the thing is, um, you know, I saw this, I said, wow, they had, they had cards with every possible subject. But the, the one I found in this antique shop, the very first card, was a full moon. And I thought, well, that's cool. <laughs> what else is out there? So I'll pass this around. And uh, feel free to you know take a look at it. You can leave it in the protective sleeve. This one's probably about 125 years old or so. But let's get started. <laughs> so I want to share with you astronomy in 3D. After a while, when you peer through your telescope, you're really looking at 3D stuff, but it's flat to your eye. So let's learn a little bit about this because uh, 3D and astronomy has been out there for quite a long time. Um, used in an amateur uh, sense, as you'll see the card coming around, uh, but also uh, for professional reasons in the sciences. 3D photography, 3D imaging is uh, extremely useful. Even in even my line of work, I'm a first scientist, and we use 3D photogrammetry, 3D imaging. Um, and it's it has its well, we've all been part of this, right? And everybody everybody remembers Viewmaster at some point. Uh, the more antique one for the one that came out sort of in the 70s, 80s, or 90s. And uh, these days, uh, they've upgraded it where you drop your phone into this sort of holder thing and you got the app, and it, it brings up two stereo images. Um, but uh, what I had seen in that antique shop some three decades back was. This is a gadget, a stereo octagon where you put this card in and, and play the slide from bone to have a focus. Um, at that time, in the 1870s or so, uh, there were other devices built where uh, maybe for some parlor or, or maybe some public exhibition, these, these wooden boxes, like one on the left would be a tabletop model, the one on the right is obviously a floor standing one. Were inside of these devices um, was like a conveyor belt. Now, the conveyor belt had clips that would hold different cards. And you would turn a crank, looking through the little viewer, and you would see these different 3D images all come up. You know, it's pretty cool. And uh, so uh, there it is from the working end. Um, 
they were they were um, sort of like the visual encyclopedias of the 1870s. They were marketed to uh, mostly to rural communities. Farmers would buy you know sets of these things. Um, this one here would have had 1,200 uh, cards. It was called the Tour of the World. There were other ones that had small specialized topics. Could have bought a set of 100 cards and would say uh, the sites of Palestine or you know other places. Um, and you know, uh, photographers would, would be using this device here, and even in scientific journals sometimes, um, and modeling the 3D structure of uh, proteins, looking at the molecules themselves. Some of the journals will you know, issue a, a 3D viewer with the, with the journal, so you can actually see uh, the molecule in 3D. But uh, back in the era, and uh, these, these uh, images you're going to see, uh, a couple of things. One is uh, I took photos of the cards. So many of these cards initially, I'll give you a heads up. You know, these are too heat right now. So I'll give you a heads up for when it's time to go to the glasses. And just to be clear on the glasses, you're going to want left on uh, red on left eye. Okay? Blue will be on your right. So here's a flat 2D image of uh, Niagara Falls, just as an example of uh, many, the many topics that they had. Um, other natural sites uh, in Yosemite. Um, the cards were put out by a wide range of companies. After a certain amount of time, a certain amount of competitiveness, you know, the smaller ones got knocked out of business and there were two heavyweights that kind of took over. Uh, you know, back in those days, when it came to 3D photography, the Amazon was uh, a company called uh, Keystone, and another big company was called uh, Underwood and Underwood. But they they were they had photographers covering the globe, taking you know really wonderful wonderful photos uh, of virtually everything. And so um, the uh, sequoias out the redwoods out in California, um, they had cards. Uh, for the era, you know, um, you know, humor. It was this. This was a popular humor series called the Pesky Nephew, who would always go around and pull little pranks on the neighbors or family members. So I don't know if that's the uncle who fell asleep, but on his bald head he now has a face. Um, and uh, religious themes, and uh, more to the risque, and uh, even pornographic. So they they covered everything. Uh, these, of course, were made and uh, marketed around the world. Uh, they were extremely popular. Uh, here's a Keystone card showing the Great Wall of China. Uh, I just know from experience looking at these cards, this is probably taken circa 1920 or so. But this particular one, the other image you saw probably goes back to about 1910. Um, here's the Lake Memorial. Uh, this image is circa 1923-ish or so, and the, the more more events uh, so I think just some of the 22 or so. Um, so the uh, best part of the show is coming. Here we go. <laughs> but, oh, there, go. there we go. So um, I transformed that that card into a 3D image, uh, which in this business. Because you're using these glasses, um, I, I took what was technically called a stereo pair, which is a left and a right image. And when you're looking, looking through the old fashioned stereo opticon with the card in it, there was a divider between your eyes. So your left eye could only see the left half of the card, and your right eye could only see the right half of the card. And uh, so your brain getting those two different images slightly different because the camera would take it at slightly different angles. Your brain would stitch those two together and you get a 3D image. So I, I had transformed the, the stereo pair into what we call, and what you're looking at now, is technically called an anaglyph. And what I had done was I color coded left image towards red, right image towards blue, and then kind of mashed them together and you've got Lincoln here in 3D, uh, approximately. You know, I, I didn't get into the weeds of like trying to do it in a really precise way, but uh, there it is. Now, um, it all began uh, from a scientific point of view. 
Uh, 3D imaging, especially in the world of astronomy, began back uh, circa 1860 or so with a fellow by the name of uh, Professor uh, Henry Draper. And so um, what he had done around that time was uh, photography was in its earliest of days, and the paradigms were kind of fading away and they're going into better technology. Um, it, it occurred to him that um, he could come up with a 3D image of the moon if he took advantage of uh, an image that was full moon on, say, one lunar cycle, and then on the next lunar cycle, catch the moon again. And because the moon has that apparent uh, vibration, that rocking, changing the position, he realized that that would sort of substitute as two different views at slightly different angles of the same object. And so the one full moon in one month, the full moon in the following month, actually for this here, it's, it's actually two months later, uh, the slight shift of the moon's position, uh, he came up with what was what functionally sort of like left image, right image. You know? And so uh, I, I took the stereo pair and colorized one side, colorized the other side, and then stitched the whole thing together. So with this image here, if you start at the bottom, looking at the lettering, and then work your way up slowly, you'll see the lettering move slowly away from you. And then by the time you move up those steps of lettering, you get to the lunar image itself. You should be able to see the moon bowl down at you. Okay. With it, with it. So, so right now, you're seeing for the first time in your life the moon as a sphere. No one had ever been able to see this until whatever it was, Apollo 8 or whatever mission actually got close enough to the moon. So the astronauts who were in the command module could actually be close enough to the moon to actually see it as it is, a sphere. Because to the ancient Romans, they regarded the moon as a shield. They saw it as you and I see it, flat. The reason why it's flat for you and I is because our eyes have a certain, well, baseline. For the average adult, somewhere around 60 to 70 millimeters separation between your eyes. Those 60 to 70 millimeters separation allows you to see an object from two slightly different angles. If the object is too far away, your eyes don't really see much of a difference in angle for very distant objects, which is why most of the time, for you and I, clouds appear to be flat in the sky. It's only on those rare occasions, maybe when a, uh, a rainstorm is clearing out and the clouds are kind of low and they're moving fast, that you can sort of perceive like a 3D field of the clouds in the sky. That's because they're close enough that for your 60 or 70 millimeters, you can pick up at a slightly different angle, okay? So not until the Apollo program did people were ever really able to see that the moon is in fact a sphere. You know, which is pretty, pretty cool. The first time I saw it, and when I like wrote a card I was like, holy cow. <laughs> okay. So here's a Joseph Joseph Bates. Bates did not have a license from Draper. So even 150 years ago, everything was being pirated. You know, people got somehow they got a hold of the negatives or they somehow copied off of the prints and, and Draper's two full wounds were copied and distributed throughout the world. I don't know if he made a dime off of it, but pirating existed back then too. Okay. And if you know, if you if I went back to the other slide, if you look at carefully which craters are showing, which ones are shadowed, and, and all that kind of stuff, you say, yeah, that's exactly the same negative being stolen by someone else. So moving on. Uh, folks got the idea of watch us the full moon. And so they moved into Guinness. And this is a 2D shot for you. And also uh, moving towards the uh, third quarter phase, again, a flat one for you right here. Uh, the actual 3D, which the reason why I didn't you know, transform this into an anaglyph because eh, it was so dope. The folks making the cards would run with the topic 
anything with astronomy, even in the most remote way, would be something that they would try to sell. I mean, after all, even 150 years ago, people were trying to turn a buck and make some money, you know, so human nature really hasn't changed too much. Here's a phone when I grabbed off the web right time, uh, one time. If you put this, this is on 3D, so you want to see this in your classroom. If you look at this very carefully, especially across the top, if you want to trade places, oh, that's <laughs> It's a series of discs that are stacked. Okay. Um, I don't know if you can up here, but you might be able to see that there's the edge of the disc up here, there's a second disc around here, and another one, and another one, and they're all sort of stacking, uh, getting progressively smaller and smaller to move towards the center. And that sort of gives you that sphere uh, illusion or so. Um, jumping ahead. Uh, <laughs> So, like I said, they, they would try to come up with uh, stereo cards for everything you could possibly imagine. This was supposedly um, two images of the sun, maybe about a day or two apart. And so the rotation, the full rotation, would be about 25 days on the equator, mm -hmm. speaking. Um, that's a mess, you know. I have to sort of think that they were able to sell a, uh, a kit of these things, 100 images for the sciences. And uh, many times the the actual quality of the 3D was highly questionable. You know, I mean, a lot of times it was just very flat. But they could at least claim that they had a 3D image of the sun. Um, speaking of sun, this is 3D. So if you want to throw a glass, this is actually the uh, the eclipse of uh, 1991, July 11. Uh, yeah, 91. Uh, this was taken by uh, Dr. Uh, Dale Crookshank at NASA, JPL, uh, who sent me this uh, <clears throat> sent me this one time as sort of a gift. I think he was actually in the Hawaii observation. We were on the other side of the planet, Baja. But you should be able to see uh, the sun as a black, flat disk floating above the corona. And you kind of get some depth separation there. Mm -hmm. So there should be a little bit. Um, hey, Steve? Yeah. One thing I had to mention is when we were up at the that area outside of Cabo San Lucas, where we have that beautiful view of the ocean, you can see the, the shell from the sun or from the eclipse coming in at 1800 miles an hour. It was quite yeah. like Yeah, yeah, it was pretty impressive. He's right. Um, so, um, how does it all work? I mean, because there is a science, scientific value to this kind of thing, and this has been done for a very, very long time. Um, probably into the 1920s and 1930s, certainly through World War II and moving forward. Uh, in a terrestrial sense, what you would have is an aircraft flying at a fixed height, fixed speed, uh, probably cameras on the underbelly. And the idea is that as the aircraft would fly forward um, on some path, uh, you know, that, that, that camera would be snapping off photos of the terrain uh, underneath uh, the aircraft. And the idea is that uh, there was now a photo, probably if it was an object of interest, maybe some building, uh, as the aircraft was approaching it, a, a camera would catch one image of one side, the approach side of the building, and of course the plane would fly further, take another shot from the second angle as depicted here. Roughly a 60% overlap. You have two images looking at the same object on the ground, but separation where the two positions of the plane are kind of like the baseline of your eyes, okay? And then you can put those two images together and you would see the structures or the topography of the hills and valleys in 3D. And this is how a lot of um, contour mapping was done if you ever had a topographic maps to try to very quickly and very efficiently create, you know, topographic maps of large geographic areas. Um, so using that very theme, uh, it was taken into space. Because as you can think about it, you had the Apollo missions going to the moon. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, everyone at the time for decades was taking as detailed photos of the lunar surface as they could. But of course, when you finally get a spacecraft that could orbit the moon, now you're up really close to get some really high detail. This is from Apollo 10. And you're looking at the command module, otherwise known as Charlie Brown, if you remember. Does anyone remember what the lunar module was called on that mission? 
Yeah. Now, the thing is, uh, the command module uh, had cameras on it. And so, um, you know, for that, that person who was up there while their friends were down walking on the surface, not with Apollo 10. Apollo 10 was the full dry run. Um, so let's say, say in terms of Apollo 11, it's the infamous uh, Mike Collins, I think just passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, one of the things that he kept busy with was as he was orbiting in Buzz and, and, and uh, Neil were down there was to make sure that the photography that they were doing try to get the highest possible resolution images, much as the aircraft slide had shown you uh, was being done. But that's that's all uh, in the orbital, orbital sense. Um, they were capturing images like this. This is one, this is one of your glasses. This is the Apennine mountain range, and sort of north northwest central on the moon. And you should be able to see um, that the crater should have some reasonable depth to it. And the mountains themselves, more towards the central right side, this should be popping up at you. So that's a good good sense of a, uh, a lunar uh, application of the terrestrial um, imaging that was done. Okay. Uh, on the surface, a uh, few people know that uh, probably about 60% plus of all the images that they shot while on the surface of the moon were all done in 3D, stereo pairs of sorts, okay? Uh, because they, they wanted to, again, try to capture as much detail and much information as possible. Uh, this is the Taurus Litro uh, region, and I think this was. I might be wrong, it could be Apollo 17, I think was, was there. Um, they had a couple of lucky instances. Um, here's Pete Conrad with uh, Apollo 12. Uh, they just so happened to land within a hiking distance, you might say, of Surveyor 3. So he popped on and over and got, got a look at it. I'm not sure who actually got the other photo. I can remember. Was it me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, pretty cool that we got a 3D picture of that one. Um, and uh, here's Pete Conrad again. A nice crisp one with the glasses. This, that, this one definitely has like, wow. <laughs> yeah. You know? Isn't that crazy that just how crisp it is? It's like, man, that's amazing. You know? It almost looks like you can just walk right into that image. Yeah. That's like, I think that's so cool. Okay. So, uh, look right here. So, there's the infamous uh, footprint photo. We're all familiar with the kind of school of games. Um, it's actually part of a stereo pair. Yeah, okay, one footprint photo was actually two. Um, you know, and, and this is Neil Armstrong, uh, his footprint, not Neil, but the footprint. The uh, you people realize that you know, when they were out there, uh, on the lunar surface, and this was true for all missions. Uh, that were on the lunar surface. They had practice for months and months and months, literally every single thing that they were going to do. And when they got onto the lunar surface, they were like actors carrying out the script. And every second was accounted for. And one of the things he was supposed to do, because I believe the story goes, he had a camera mounted on the belly of his spacesuit. And what he was to do was to step forward, make the print, and step back, bend over, take the picture, shift from the second angle, get the other picture. But I guess what he did was he stepped back, leaned, shot, and he slightly came up as he shifted over. So he added a second axis in it, and it kind of screwed it up. But anyways, let's cut to the chase. There it is in 3D. Now, there was a reason for doing this, because since this was the first time you had someone actually on the moon, literally making footprints and stuff, one of the questions that were uh, still was somewhat unknown, but not entirely, and as a earth scientist, I could, I could have given them some hints. <laughs> but one of the things that were unknown was, was what was the degree of cohesiveness of the lunar dust? In other words, if you make a footprint, 
and you step out, if you do this down at the beach where the, you know, the sand is wet, you expect the sand to give you a really good crisp footprint, but there's no water in the mold. So how are you gonna come up with a crisp footprint? Well, I can tell them that anyways. You have to see the, the molecular, you have to see the dust in, in a microscope. It, it's actually highly angular stuff. It looks like fragmented glass. Some of it is. And that kind of interlocks with neighboring particles to sort of give that, that lunar dust a very cohesive like quality as if it was moist, you know, of course it wouldn't be. But that, that's pretty cool. You should be able to see a nice crisp front or two. I didn't know that at the time. What? They didn't know the nature of the dust at the time. No, they can make some logical assertions about it because there were two two things happening. One was some of the dust on the moon is just micrometeorites being dumped over gazillions of years. That's all. Dump, 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 dump. Other dust on the moon was a result of volcanics and were uh, uh, as a result of impacts ejecta being molten, quickly cooling. Uh, you, can, you can make some pretty reasonable guesses on what to expect from particle types that you would see on a microscopic level, but nonetheless, to actually prove it and actually have some hard evidence, that's that's why they were doing this. Um, so why stop there? Radar 3D Venus here, you want to throw it? Not, not the greatest, uh, I, I, I can't recall what uh, mission where this was done. Um, this is radar. Okay, a radar stereo pair of radios made in some banana clip. And you can see sort of uh, right half, you sort of see a depressed area, and the rest of it is kind of a flatter plane. Uh, not terribly exciting. Uh, leaving the second planet, we head to planet number four. This was taken by uh, Professor E.E. E. Uh, Barter at Yerkes Observatory uh, using the 40 inch refractor. Uh, this is like uh, September 28th. Uh, 1909, and uh, I don't know. Do you see much in here? <laughs> I don't see it either. I, you know, I think this is where they were kind of pushing it. Um, let's try this one. Phobos, moon of Mars. This is Viking one, circa whatever that was, 1976. I think it was something like that. And uh, heading out to Jupiter, this is Io or Eo. Some of these, uh, I don't know if I can in here. I think, oh, wrong button. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Uh, here we are. This is uh, Pathfinder 1997 on a Martian service. Um, some of those stones to the upper right should be standing pretty well out for you, you know? And you should also be able to get a pretty good feel for just sort of a gentle rolling terrain upon which you have all these crazy angular rocks. And somebody was trained in geology as I am. Yeah, I look at it, like, that's, that's kind of funky. Uh, wow. Um, a whole bunch of these things. Again, you can sort of pick up on the gentleness of the train. And towards the upper right, you can see sort of a, a crater rim in the far distance. You should be able to pick up um, sort of a ridge line before you see that, that distant crater rim. More cool 3D of some of these rocks. Again, you see like two twin peaks out there in the distance, but before them, there's a ridge line of the crater itself. And here's the first of the many uh, lunar rovers that's a soldier in 1997. Uh, Pathfinder landed on July 4th of 97. I don't know how, how many days later they actually got the rover going, but uh, there it is. Okay, so um, here's a vintage shot of Saturn. This is again uh, Professor Bernard at the uh, Piece Observatory using the 40 inch refractor. And this is coming from you at, uh, gosh, this is like November 19th of 1911. Will be. 
the amount of 3D in this that uh, I uh, <laughs> that button's not working for me. So, uh, 2D shop. Uh, like I said, they were pushing the theme of, of, of 3D maybe a little too far. Even trying to get uh, planet Uranus and its two moons in 3D, yeah, it doesn't work too well. You know what I mean? So, um, going here. This is an interesting one. Uh, this is again uh, Professor Barnard with his colleague, uh, Dr. Frank Sullivan. Uh, 1904, this dates from uh, November 15th of that year, using again the Europe's 40 inch refractor. And uh, so they were trying to capture uh, in 3D a meteor that was crossing a right. Uh, the actual card, if I had a stereo viewer for you right now, I, I'd sort of give it a, a, a two on a scale of one to 10 for 3D. But the interesting thing was, I don't know if they, if they realized it or not, but uh, I wish I could, if I took it out of the PowerPoint display, I could zoom in on this. They inadvertently captured the horse head nebula. You catch it right there? Yeah, if I was to, uh, trying to zoom in a little bit, you could actually see a little bit of a poke of the dark cloud. It's, it's pretty cool. Here's Comet Morehouse, uh, November 16th of 1908. And this one has a pretty good feel of uh, floating in front of the stars. So it has a nice, nice 3D look to it. Um, one of the more memorable comments from, from that era. So uh, that one's pretty cool. All right. Now, um, again, they could sell a card, they could sell a card. <laughs> this is the Adler Planetarium in May of 1930. Um, the gentleman, Adler, was John Adler, he was a philanthropist, he was crazy rich. He had heard about planetarium projectors in Germany. And uh, it turns out that uh, 2023 is the 100th anniversary of planetariums. Uh, the first one being built in uh, Germany. And uh, my sites. This is, uh, so, you know, Adler said, wow, this is fantastic. We've got to get one of these things. He and his wife went over to Germany. They brought an architect with him. And with his gazillions of dollars, they designed the planetarium. And he bought with the then state of the art technology in Sites Park II. Uh, and if, you can sort of pick up on this one if you look at it in your 3D glasses. Uh, it's staged, of course. <laughs> you know, the people in the background are all kind of tapped in to fit the field, and you got a few folks in the front to kind of give it a little bit more depth. But that one works out pretty good. Um, switching to a, a much older observatory. <laughs> so there ain't much happening with this one, but you should be able to pick up that compression that that uh, one stone is sitting in. I think if you try to go back to the to the ring of stones, in, I don't know. So you, you can see one stone that's central in the background, but there, there isn't too much depth on this one. It's, it's kind of marginal. But uh, here we go, a little bit better. So this is a Lick Observatory in Mount Hamilton, uh, circa 1902. And within that dome, if I'm not mistaken, is the 36 inch refractor, um, which we get a better for it people from here. Yeah. I love this one. This is one of my favorites because if you kind of like sway one side to the other, it goes with you. <laughs> yeah. And also I love all the crazy little dots that they got there. It was, it was sort of you know, a little bit of a little smoke in. And so likewise, uh, we'll take a look at this again this, from a slightly different angle. There we go. That's a goodie right there. Cool shot, huh? They don't, they don't make them like that anymore. Huh?
Yeah. I don't know if you know, but back in the 19, late 1980s, there was a company in Japan who imported camera. The name of the company was Nimslow. And they were located in Torrington, Connecticut. And it was a stereo camera. So when you took the pictures, oh, yeah, yeah. you could only have it processed by them. And if you've ever gone to like a religious bar and you've seen, you know, Jesus uh, with his hands, and when you walk by, he kind of looks at you. <laughs> well, they would convert all the pictures you took into 3D images. They would play around the radio photographic kind of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, photographic image. Okay. Yeah. Those cameras were worth a fortune now. <laughs> yeah, and there were, there were cameras out there. I think they were made, I'm not sure if they were foreign, I don't know if they were It was called Stereo Realist. And it was a camera, you know, the film, go back to film, and we had two lenses on it. Um, I suspect they might have been. Taking molding images, creating what they would call a lenticular image. Right. And uh, a couple of years ago, the U.S. Post Office put out some stamps where uh, it was about magic, and, and the stamp actually had a, uh, like, like a hand pulling a rabbit out of a hat. You know, the U.S. stamp, you know, and it was no one just in the last three or four years. So it was a T. Rex trying to reach out and bite you or something like that. I feel pretty crazy. Uh, on the other hand, that's something. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we've seen very, various, uh, very, variation of quality of the images. What determines uh, a good three D image? Yeah. Uh, like if you're going to do it yourself, uh, which is sometimes what I've done. I, I, like I've, I've gone off on a trip. Um, one is understanding. Like, like, for instance, you know, I, I've gotten off on a trip with maybe I was in the Grand Canyon, and I, there I'm at the rail, and I, I just take a uh, you know, phone or whatever, take like a snapshot, and I just step over a little bit, and I take another one. So, what would make it a good shot is if you still have around your house, like an old Viewmaster reel or so, a Viewmaster viewer, throw a reel in, look at the viewer. If you look at it carefully, um, You'll, you'll see that they sort of rig the image in the sense that they carefully chose an image that would have a distinct background, mid-ground, foreground, and maybe try to top something in there because that way when you actually see those two images through the stereo viewer, you get that depth because the more of that foreground, middle ground, background, and stuffing in between you can get, you get that more of a continuum of depth, which makes it more realistic. Okay, because that's what your eyes are doing right now. Your eyes are not seeing this room in staggered layers, we're seeing a continuum of depth, but always respecting the baseline. Because at some point, you go for something that's too far out, flat, you know, like the clouds in the sky. But you could take a 3D picture of clouds in the sky, because and then jump over by a couple of yards and then try it again. You know, there's there are publications out there that take you through all the math on how to set it up. But um, that was one of the cool things about those cameras. The gentleman had mentioned and the stereo, the stereo realist is what they, they just kind of go with the baseline and where your eyes were already at. You just snapped a picture and took pictures. Yeah. A few years ago, um, there was available for photographers. Um, a bracket set up where you would put two identical cameras to put them a little bit apart, and then you could synchronize the other yeah. things so yeah. you get the two images simultaneously. Yeah, yeah. And there were people for a while, I guess, when like uh, if they didn't use that trick, um, they were taking two cameras and trying to hack off one third of one and one third of the other and stitch the other two together. You know, back in the days of thinking around with film and trying to make a light tight and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, plus there was, a, there was a dude out there for a while. Uh, he tried to start a little cottage industry where um you know, he was just marketing to the other person. He would just let's let's make like phones out there or you could do a phone. Take an image, just shift over like just two or three inches, take a second image. But this guy I was selling you was back in the old days when we had these things called prints. Remember, we'd send your film out and get it back in print. <laughs> so you had these two prints, and you put them down on a piece of paper, one on top of the other. The upper would be left, the lower would be right. And he had this plastic viewer with like periscope mirrors. 
where you look into it and one one eye was going up and over the other eye was going down and over and it would you have a stereo viewer and yeah, it worked pretty well you know but it came out at the time that cameras were dying and phones were taking over the world you know, and people didn't have prints anymore but i guess maybe if you have that viewmaster app you can still resurrect your two digital images over your phone and display them. So that's that's there. That's right. Are you familiar with the uh, Vine Maze Company, the London Stereo Stereo, the Stereoscopic Stereo Optic uh, Company? With the that's what he does with the uh, he does the um, Stereo 3D. Yeah, um, not specifically, but yes, he's been doing uh, 3D imagery. He's very interested in uh, asteroids, uh, orbiting that that are out there. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know we had a company going though. Yes. Do we possibly use this technique for uh, motion pictures? Uh, yeah, in principle, you know, should be able to be be done. And I think probably it wasn't one thing. You have dual mounted movie cameras. And you don't necessarily have to have while you're shooting one with a red lens and the other with a blue, you can do that afterwards. Yeah, you because know, I mean, that's what I did, right? Those are just black and white photos, and I just put them in Photoshop and made one blue and one with red. And so, yeah, as long as your frames are going, then you can transform it to an anaglyph, and there you have it. The 1950s theater shot, or a classic shot, right? Oh, yeah, this is a whole bunch of wearing 3D glasses. It's, it's what it is. I guess, what was it? It was a creature of a black and blue shot in 3D or something like that. Any other questions? Yeah. You know, uh, you said that the stereo optic only is kind of you know marketed, mass marketed, uh, you know, yeah. popular in the world. How is it marketed? I mean, did you get it oh. on the Sears catalog? <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I was thinking of that the other day. I said, yeah, you know, Sears had everything in their catalog. I guess uh, the other companies did. Even Sears was selling houses through their catalog mm -hmm. uh, as a kid. Can you imagine that? Uh, so yeah, but yeah, but my understanding was it was a lot of like full and brush, not like the door, and or or like back in the day when they come around trying to sell a family uh, a set of encyclopedias, right? I mean that was that was a viable way to make a living back then. It was knock on doors. Not as crazy as sounds. Now you get shot. <laughs> <laughs> and do you have any sense of the mass market how? Now, you said that obviously there was a range of images. Um, oh, yeah. uh, some of them did not see for work, you would say now. Um, but what fraction of the market was uh, as well other images? You know, was, were these popular things? Or I, I don't think they were terribly popular. You know, I think. Uh, As, as I've seen these cards, you know, uh, being sold, you know, through eBay now, or when I was going through antique stores and whatever, if, if what you saw for the subject matter represented, you know, the, the market of what was sellable, you know, the Astro stuff is under 1%, I would say easily. Much of it was like battle scenes from wars you know, in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. Um, cities, architecture, um, uh, like for instance, there was, uh, what was the big one? The Pan American uh, Exposition circa 1901, 1904, somewhere around there. It's actually when McKinley got shot, yeah. whatever year that was. So they would have maybe selling these kits, uh, or, or I should say, a, a set, mm -hmm. a set of 100 or 200 of these uh, of that particular topic. Religious ones were very popular, especially as sets. And as I mentioned about Palestine, uh, when I showed you the Great Wall, the, those were very popular. They would have had one like, say, Taj Mahal, it would have been for a you know, big band, it would have been something for the Eiffel Tower. And maybe the photographer was crazy enough to actually go to the tip of the Eiffel Tower. You know, and take a shot. So that was most of the market. The astral stuff is more on the rare side. Yeah. And then even then, you see that they pushed it a little too far. Mars in 3D is our. Uh,
when you saw that picture before of the two planes flying to having pitches, you know, imagine where a plane like the SR 71 or some of the new spy camera uh, uh, satellites that they have the optics, the optics in them and what they can do. Yeah. So good that they don't want to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> there was a question back here. Yeah. I just want people to know you with the new release of uh, log is somewhat new. Uh, Adam um, Andy Saunders, the Apollo we Apollo we passed it. I mean, you will see that. Oh, no. you're gonna see it. You're gonna see it. It's like a must pack. Really? Andy uh, Saunders. Okay, yeah. The other one I was gonna say was uh, like in the must have just. Just go to YouTube or Google, and NASA does so much stuff in 3D. It's unbelievable. That 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 video, the tour of the uh, space station, that's that's from our uh, Marshall Space Center, and that's a, that's a NASA product. So they're out to show people what they do and, and to do it in 3D. You know, because obviously the impact is pretty amazing. You know, we've all seen those holiday messages from the astronauts in the space station. It's like. Oh, yeah, okay, great. But you know, when it's in 3D, it's like, holy cow, that's really wild. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are there any objects kind of in the sweet spot of how far away they are and how quickly they're moving that you can get a decent effect like this taking the images six months apart when the Earth is on opposite sides? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was trying, I'm sure. You know, trying to use the Earth as it's at the baseline. Uh, that was the whole idea of like measuring star distances using parallax now, right? Uh, trying to take advantage of that. Um, but it's slight when you're doing it. Yeah. Or, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. So the ones that you showed like from the um, 1800s, yeah. was it all photographic or did anybody try to do an artwork? Uh, yeah. Um, so there are people out there who have done some artwork in 3D. Uh, very little that I'm aware of, um, but but some of it's out there, and I um, I kind of think exactly what I seen. I'm not sure if they were trying to set up like paint a cottage out in a field somewhere and they did it like an animal. Sure there were there were three D drawings. There were certainly three D drawings, more like line drawings. Uh, things like um, a line drawing of uh, geometric shapes, uh, cubes, uh, uh, tetrahedrides, tetrahedrides, and so forth. But uh, I'm not, there was a very little. That's a great question. Another place to explore. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm going to call quits today. Yeah,